Um, okay, so next up, um, this is going to blow your mind. Uh, some of you may have seen this already, but this is truly the future of smartphones. Paul, are you here? Hey, Paul, how are you? Good. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. Thanks where's for your, having where, me. Where's your little kit? It's in my pocket. It's all in your pocket. Yeah, okay. as cell phones should be, right? Absolutely. Let's go to the Elmo here. I think we're okay. going to. I think they were going to do an. Oh, we're going to do it over there. Okay, but, uh, let's do it over there. No, you, over here is better. Whatever, whatever you prefer. Now you work at the Google. I do. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, for about a week now. Uh, <laughs> oh right, because you were at Motorola. That's right. That's right. Um, let's get this out of the way. Okay, so you're showing me what. So I'm showing you an industri a high fidelity industrial design prototype, right? So this is this is non-functional. I'll show you some pieces of, uh, of functionality in a second here. Sure. Um, and so this is the Project Ara phone, uh, to, hopefully to be known as the Google Ara in uh, uh, in in the coming uh, in the year year to come or so. Um, so the device is modular. Um, there's both front-facing modularity. Um, let me just remove the display here, uh, as well as. Uh, rear-facing modularity. So you're taking your phone apart right now. That's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. And uh, our goal here is to create basically a third-party ecosystem of module developers, is to change the way innovation happens in the hardware space and make it a lot more like the software and app store model. Or transformers. <laughs> or transformers. As it That's were. That's right. So, so uh, when these come sliding out, just so people know, yep. there's a little bit of a magnetic which actually you can see the play on it there. Yeah, that's right. It's a little, it's like actually kind of a, feels nice. Yeah. It's a nice hand feel. Reminds me of the uh, cookie dough from before. Yeah. So, um, so if I could explain that for a second. Yeah. That's a, so that's a, about a three Newton permanent magnet. Uh, and three that's Newton. Three Newton. So very weak, right? Yeah. It's just enough for you to put the modules in and be able to flip the device over without, uh, without the modules uh, falling out. Um, the functional prototype, uh, which if you could click uh, to the next slide, is it, oh, I oh. guess the slides go away. Uh, yeah, the slides go away okay. when we do I this. have a picture of Here the functional go. prototype. Here we go. Uh, and if you could click to the next slide, uh, or somebody could click to Here the next go. slide. There we go. Click? There we go. Yep, so that's the functional prototype. First functional prototype that's under development. Uh, I, it was supposed to boot for this demo. Oh, really? Uh, it doesn't quite boot. Uh, <laughs> so I brought, I brought a module from the functional prototype. So I can oh. show, you, show you sort of a functional module. I'll get to those in a second. Uh, so this is a real, real Ara module. It's a Wi-Fi module. OK, so we're back um, to the camera. Yeah, Got yeah it. so we're back to the camera here. Uh, and uh, let me remove the enclosure. The enclosures are user serviceable. User serviceable in? Meaning that a user can remove the enclosure. Got it. Uh, and swap it out for a different one. Because not only are we after functional customization here, but we're after aesthetic customization as well. Ah, so Prada could make, or whatever, Hermes could make their own cases. So you could absolutely do that. Um, could I 3D I think, print it? Uh, th these are 3D printed. Uh, oh, these are 3D printed. This is a 3D printed one. Ah, okay. uh, here are some other examples of 3D printed ones. Um, we have a, a, a big relationship with 3D Systems on this. Uh, it's our, uh, our partner on this program. And 3D Systems is actually developing the first uh, production volume consumer grade uh, 3D printer. Uh -huh. And we're also experimenting with printing functional materials like conductive inks ah. to be able to do custom antennas. And uh, I think I have an antenna oh, here. Wow. So going so from cosmetic 3D printing to also functional. That's right. Wow. And okay. so that's an example. This is not 3D printed, but this is designed for 3D printing, right? So this is made using traditional uh, printed circuit board manufacturing methods. And this is the antenna that's in the Wi-Fi module, but it's glued in uh, uh, here. Uh, this, so this is the, the bare so antenna. So just step back a second. This frame yep. is a battery and what else? Because it's incredibly so light. There, there is a battery in the frame. Obviously, okay. this is a, an appearance model. But yeah. there, I, I, in, the, in the functional prototype, there is a battery in the frame. That battery is very, very small. The purpose for that battery is to act as reserve so that you can hot swap uh, the modules. And inc that includes the battery modules. And so this module could be a battery. It could easily be a battery. The uh, two by two. A two by two, that's two right. Two battery. Or I could do a one by two battery. Or you could do a one by two or a one by one, although that wouldn't be very much battery capacity. Maybe a small um, amount. Any module can be a uh, power source, power sink, or a power storage device. Uh -huh. Uh, or anything else for that matter, right? So the modules, the only thing that we constrain is this partitioning scheme, what we call the one by one, one by two, two by two. Got it. And we provide uh, our, uh, to the developer community uh, the module developer's kit, which is basically an open platform specification uh, that and a reference implementation that allows anybody to create their own modules for this platform. And that, and that MDK is free and open. Um, we'll publish it probably in a, in a little over a month. 
So uh, if Eve Bahar, who was on the stage yesterday, yep. says, I want to create a module yep. for a jam box speaker-ish kind yep. of thing, he could make a one by one, two by two, one by two, or whatever this is called. That's right. The front-facing modules have a slightly different different parceling scheme right. or partition. So scheme. you could basically have someone like Jawbone make their own speaker system for this, or Beats by Dre. Yep. And I could say, you know what? I'm going to a party. Mm -hmm. I want to put th I want to put a subwoofer and four speakers back here and battery life, but I don't need the camera. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, so you could even imagine uh, sharing modules uh, inside a family, right? Um, ah. I think that works better, perhaps, that's more appealing to, to perhaps lower end users who can't afford uh, sort of a high, a high definition camera, uh, uh -huh. but might be able to do to sort of pool, pool resources to do that. Um, we really set out to design uh, the platform for uh, 6 billion people, and that's 1 billion of existing smartphone users today and 5 billion feature phone users. Uh, and that's part, of Google's, uh, that's part of Google's objectives, right, is to bring the internet, and in our case, the mobile internet, to the next 5 billion. So this seems like so super customizable and awesome, it would make me think that it would be more expensive to have this customization. Um, will it be more expensive at first, or do you have some strategy to make it cheaper? So, well, why yeah, would this so, be cheaper to do something so extensible? Sure. So, so there's certainly some overhead to, to modularity. There's no yeah. doubt about that. It's a network on device, right? Mm -hmm. So we're creating a packet switch network. There's overhead with the, the, the magnets uh, that hold the device, uh, the, the modules in, and the, and the network protocol. Um, and so all of those things absolutely do come with some cost. Uh, the countervailing factors are uh, the fact that the, uh, that the consumer gets to decide exactly and, uh, and only what functionality goes into the device, right? So if you don't use a camera, right, if you want a really inexpensive stripped down phone, you can do that. In fact, you can get a Wi-Fi only device. Um, and so we talk uh, frequently about what we call the gray phone, which is aesthetically gray to sort of invite, uh, invite expression on the part of the user. Uh, and it's a phone that contains just a display, uh, a low-end application processor uh, that still runs Android, of course, right. uh, a Wi-Fi module, and a battery. And we're targeting $50 a bill of materials cost for that device, which is the crossover point uh, between feature phones and smartphones. So there is a lot of uh, margin locked up in a Samsung or, you know, HTC or, um, yep. you know, Apple phone. Sure. And the reason they make so much money is because they're putting all these things together. Is this a move by Google to take out all the margin of the hardware business and just get everybody competing so ra so rapidly on each individual piece that the cost of a smartphone essentially goes to zero or close to zero? Yeah, so I, I think we're less interested in people's margins than we are in the pace and level of innovation in the hardware ecosystem, right? Ah. So I think that there are plenty of opportunities to make money out of a, of a highly competitive ecosystem, but what we are after is getting the number of brains in that ecosystem uh, up into the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, comparable to app, Android app developers, but just at the hardware level. And we do that by lowering the barrier to participation and allowing component developers or people who have never participated in the smartphone industry before, right? So for instance, an acoustics company, right, that may not be a, a, a mobile component vendor today, uh, could now uh, basically have uh, the ability to market directly to, to the consumer and see if there is an interest in, in them entering the mobile space. So how much would they have to pay you to uh, license your technology to put Beats by Dre in here? So they don't have to pay us anything. Um, so Zero the module, dollars. That's right. It is, you can think of it logically as uh, a, an analog to Android, but at the hardware level. And so in the same way that Android is free and open source and available to anybody to, to download from the, from the Google website, the MDK, the Module Developers Kit, will be free and open as well. It's a highly disruptive concept. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I think so. Yeah, I mean, if people who are camera op, who make cameras, don't have to pay a VIG to get into the iPhone or Apple or Samsung, don't have the ability to say, hey, you have to do it on this terms yep. because we have so much distribution, mm -hmm. um, that could change everything. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this, this does have the potential to make the mobile, the, the smartphone industry a lot more exciting. How, um, how long before, yeah, what's that sort of general timeline? It, sure. you know, if we're here next year, would somebody in the audience have one of these? Uh, uh, yes, I think so. So that's, that's our goal. Um, would that I, person be a developer or a consumer? 
No, so we're getting hardware in the hands of developers much sooner than that. Wow. Uh, and in fact, so this is the, the, the first public announcement of our first ARA Developers Conference. Uh -huh. It'll be April 15th and 16th. April 15th and 16th. Yep, it'll be uh, online, streamed online, and there'll be interactive Q&A capability for online okay. participants, and it'll also be at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Wow. Uh, people can go to projectara.com and apply, apply to attend. Just for Project ARIA, not for any other Google stuff. That's right. This is a developers conference aimed specifically at the ARA MDK, walking uh -huh. through the module developers kit and getting people uh, jump started on, on the development process. Um, and, and actually, I don't know if it's possible to get the overhead camera back. I, yeah. I wanted let's to show the, the rest camera. of the functional module. Yeah, let's show the rest of the functional module here. Now, you um, were saying before, obviously, 3D printing cases like this, yeah. super, like that's a layup. And now you're starting to see, like, you know, oh, why would I want a 3D printer? Like, hey, I, I might very much want to print. You know, a new Knicks cover when Carmelo Anthony leaves the Knicks. I could get a new cover, um, you know, and, and take him off the back of my phone battery. Yep. Um, but wow, you're saying this uh, antenna could be printed in yep. a printer eventually. And it could be completely custom to the module developer, right? So, so what would be, so would that be um, I'm in a new country or I'm going to another country, they have different type of antennas, or I need a stronger signal strength, I'm going to make a bigger antenna? Why would I need to print an antenna? Yeah, so, so you could imagine uh, a variety of, of, of reasons for doing that. Uh, the, the reasons that you cited, certainly trying to access a different, different carrier network uh, or whatnot. Uh, we're also pretty excited by the form factor that it, that it affords to the antennas, right? It's basically a layered, uh, layered deposition technology. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh, so if you don't mind, let me show the rest yeah, of, the, show of, this, the, yeah. of the functional module. So, so you have the, the user removable cover here. And so I've removed the cover. Uh, it happens to contain uh, the antenna for the prototype Wi-Fi module. Uh, then there is a safety shield uh, so, that, uh, so that people can't, uh, don't touch the raw, the raw printed circuit board. That would normally be soldered on. I have it removable here to show you the rest of the module. Uh, and then you have the, the printed circuit board uh, that contains the Wi-Fi chipset in this case, uh, and it contains the uh, interface hardware for the ARA on device network. Um, and it contains here their spring pins, uh, but in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, second prototype, uh, these will be capacitive pads, uh, and that lets us maintain the sleek sort of pebble-like appearance to to the modules. Um, and, uh, and then you have two magnets, and these are special magnets. So I mentioned that the magnets in here are just permanent magnets, about three newtons in force. These magnets are electropermanent magnets. So an electropermanent magnet is one that is uh, passive in both the on state and the off state, but requires a voltage kick to tra transition between the two states. And so when they're, t when they're turned on, uh, the strength of the magnets goes up by about an order of magnitude, so to about 30 newtons, and that's more than you can exert with your finger to pry out the modules. Right. And, uh, and again, the purpose of the magnets is also uh, to, to sort of overcome this notion of the fact that a modular device has to be bulky and boxy and Lego-like, Yeah. Um, uh, and that it can be sleek and it can be sexy and, and the, the industrial design can be beautiful. So we went for this pebble-like appearance with no card edge connectors, uh, and we'll be getting rid of the spring pins that are in the first prototype uh, uh, just as soon as we can. And the, is the core innovation here this magnet, like ease of use technology? You wouldn't have made it if you didn't have that ability? Because having to snap these in and lock them with a little pin or something or like one of those tiny switches that you have to try to catch with your nail or a pen, that would have made it really lame, right? I mean. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I, I wouldn't say that that's the only thing, right? But certainly getting the industrial design, uh, and that's why we tackle that first, right? Is because oh. getting that to a place where users can be excited by it, where they find this to be palatable and a device that they can love, is um, uh, uh, we thought was a long pull in the tent uh, for a modular device. And this could, may not ha we may not have been able to do that uh, 10 years ago, uh, for instance, or 20 years ago when things were bigger. Um, so the ability to get the modular overhead down to a manageable level, to under 25% or so, uh, is really the enabler. The, these um, connectors here mm -hmm. that transfer data. Yep, as well as power. As well as power. What is this technology? In, how fast is it? Because I assume that's yeah. a key part of this, um, a key part of the uh, enabling technology. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So we're using uh, a protocol stack uh, from MIPI, which is the Mobile Industry Consortium. So we intentionally chose not to create a proprietary standard here. Uh, so this is available to to anybody who is a MIPI MIPI member. Uh, it's called MFI at the physical layer, at layer one. Uh, and it's about, it offers about 10, mega, 10 gigabits, I apologize, per connector block. So the big modules could go up to 20 gigabits. 
the, the smaller modules that have a single connector block are, are 10 gigabits. And so that allows us quite a bit of margin to, um, uh, uh, for growth, right? So that the yeah. platform can be longer lived than the obsolescence timescales and the technology timescales of each individual component, which can be different, by the way. That's the other interesting thing, right? Is displays have a different obsolescence and technology maturation timeline than processors, than baseband, than uh, cellular cameras. connectivity, than cameras. And, and they batteries. can all evolve on their natural timescales rather than forcing you to throw away your phone every two years and buy a new one. Um, it seems like the screens get better every two years, 18 months. Yeah, that's probably about right. But like cellular connectivity goes from 3G to 4G to LTE uh, much slower than that, for instance. Right, that right? might be a four-year, right. five-year cycle. Exactly. And so you could just slide out your 4G connector or whatever it is. That's right. Your antenna and yep. everything and just start over. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and perhaps, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Or keep your identity, right, on a single module and move oh, it Oh, that's an devices. interesting concept. So. I take out my identity and say, here, take my phone for the day. That's right. You can use it. It's yep. all functional, but yep. none of my pictures are on it. Yep. Or move between phones or have a work phone. Oh. And work, uh, the same I phone can have be a, a work phone and a home phone, but yeah. just with a swap of a... Or of if I wanted to go from module. a phablet to one with a keyboard, a BlackBerry-style device. Yeah, so you can do that, all right? So if you remove the, the, the front module, uh, there will be, uh, the only thing that's fixed is the location of these connector blocks. I guess I'm not showing this to yeah. anybody other than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they can see it from um, there. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, the other thing we're doing is there, uh, so these endoskeletons, we have a couple of them uh, mm. in the works. So here's a mini version. Oh, uh, this is beautiful. That, yeah, that has uh, uh, Yeah, this the, reminds me of, um, the old like Nokia's, like they had the small, thin. Yeah, everybody seems to be going towards bigger, and I'm not sure that bigger is better. Well, I mean, uh, and so here, here the consumer gets to choose again, right? Yeah, and this has these one by two, so if one of these was they're interchangeable. So right, I could take the camera and the I could just swap out the camera and my um, well, that's interesting. They magnet together. I could swap out yeah. the camera <laughs> and my memory chip and my SIM. Yep, and move it to my bigger phone and back. That's exactly right. And the endos, the endoskeletons, that's what yeah. we call the sort of the back plane here, uh, uh, we expect them to be fairly inexpensive. So they do very little other than just routing, routing data packets. It's a network switch. A network so these switch. endos would be tens of dollars maybe or something. That's right. That's yeah, right. not expensive. Yeah, we're targeting um, about 15 bucks for an endo. How many endos do you think you'll have? Because, and can the endos connect to another endo? So can I put <laughs> two of them together and make myself like, literally a small tablet that had four screens or five screens? Yeah, so, so for starters, we're developing three different endos. Uh, we have the mini, the medium, uh, and we have a wide sort of phablet size that I don't have a model of here, uh, but it basically has a, one, of, one of the two, two, two by two modules or one by two modules on both sides of the spine. So you Very can imagine nice. it being uh, a third wider. Um, and in terms of connecting endos and creating sort of things that are no longer smartphone-y, um, I think there's a lot, I think the possibilities are actually limitless, um, mm -hmm. but one thing that I've been very keen to do with the program is to make it, first, first and foremost, a great smartphone, rather than trying to focus on lots of different things and potentially ending up with something that's kind of mediocre at a lot of things. So I want it to be great at one thing and then right. look at the crossover points. And the only thing that Google owns in all of this is the endo core enabling technology, everything else is up for grabs, anybody can participate. That's right, anybody can participate. Uh, you know, certainly we want to, uh, uh, to maintain some control of the platform, right? Yeah. Uh, to ensure that there is a cohesion to the developer community, that it doesn't get fractured uh, as, as we start building it up. But we invite anybody to join the developer community. Are you scared that this thing is gonna crash constantly as people make, well, you know, people will go off the reservation and make all kinds of crazy stuff, you plug it in, your machine crashes, it freezes, and, and people just blame it on, you know, oh, the, the Google modular phone sucks because it crashes, and it really is the fact that, you know, somebody made a just poorly designed uh, module. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a consideration. Uh, I think that, uh, so we intend to create a module marketplace uh -huh. uh, with a configurator app, you know, that allows you to do all of this customization and sort of manage the, the choice that consumers are faced with, uh, both functionally and aesthetically. Um, and that marketplace will have some certification and credentialing scheme associated yeah. with it. I think it'll be much more like the Google Play Store than the iTunes Store in terms of the level of invasiveness of that, of that certification yeah. and credentialing. So you, um, you will have to be certified to be in the store? That's right, to make but, it into the store. But, but you can sell modules outside the store and consumers it. in the same way that you can download an Android app outside of the Google Play Store. You just have to go change a setting in your configuration ah, and sort of so assume the say, risk. Yeah, uh, I will allow my machine to crash. Uh, that's right. Yeah. 
That's right. Uh, and, and it's not going to be completely foolproof, right? I mean, I have apps that crash on my phone all the time. Yeah. Um, but we think we have enough safeguards being built into the platform from a thermal management perspective, from a power management perspective, that there's no safety hazard. I predict, and then if, uh, if the module is a bad module, right, then the phone will stop working, the user will take it out and know not, not, not to buy that module anymore. I'm predicting next year we're going to have a couple of companies on this stage who are launching module technology I hope so. as a startup. I yeah. mean, if this winds up getting some kind of adoption in the way Google has with, say, Chrome or Android, yep. my God, this could be an amazing ecosystem to build a startup on making phone, uh, you know, cameras. Cameras, or, or we think a particularly fruitful area is going to be personal medical diagnostics and devices for accessibility. Oh, wow. Um, we think that's pretty exciting, something that would never make it into a mainline device from a big OEM today. Ah, so a but screen for somebody who's specifically nearsighted or farsighted. Sure, or imagine uh, a spectrometer module that can do rapid analysis of fluids, right, or, or, or air or something like that, right, ah. for, uh, for diagnostics, environmental monitoring. So this starts to turn into uh, the tricorder or something. Uh, for instance, uh, and that's very personal, right? You seem right? like so, a Trekkie to me. Are you a Trekkie? <laughs> I, I, am, I am a space cadet, I admit yeah. it. Uh, I'm actually an aerospace engineer by, uh, by training. So you um, um, were in aerospace and you went for this project, why? I mean, uh, you could be working at SpaceX, right? You're like uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, so I came to, uh, to Motorola and then now Google uh, from DARPA. Uh -huh. um, and the organization that, that Project R is being developed in is called ATAP, Advanced Technologies and Projects. So it's now Google ATAP. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a pretty interesting premise, uh, which is to try the DARPA innovation model in the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is uh, a fairly short duration, very intense uh, focused projects that are at the intersection of uh, fundamental, fundamental science and a driving moonshot type, uh, type practical application. Um, and we use external communities of performers. So there are actually three people at Google, uh, myself included, who work on this project. Oh. Uh, but there are hundreds of people, uh, around 100, probably a little north of 100, a uh, dozen, dozen or more performers uh, that are external. Uh, What's it like working. to work for Larry and Sergey? I mean, they, they must love you because this is like a great, crazy moonshot. Do they like say, hey, I'm coming by to visit you? Do they interact with you on a regular basis? Or is uh, it like, see me when you're done? Uh, so I, I am new to Google. Yeah. Uh, uh, I did have an opportunity to, uh, to brief Larry early on in, in my tenure, yeah. uh, uh, tenure at Motorola on the project. Yeah. Um, I, think it is, uh, I think it is very resonant with Google values in general, right? Yeah. And I think our objectives of, of uh, sort of uh, revolutionizing and democratizing the hardware ecosystem and reaching on the user-facing side, reaching the next five billion, I think are pretty well aligned with. And they'll uh, just give you whatever resources you need for a project like this, right? Like, they're not stingy about like, hey, spend money and try to make this work. They're, it's just like, hey, go for it. So I guess I would phrase it this way. I think that, uh, that, that, ide that ideas are in shorter supply. So, so I think we're idea limited uh, rather, than, uh, rather than resource limited. Um, project ARA is going to be held on, the first webcast will be at what website? Where would we Project go? ARA.com. Oh, okay. And so that website went ARA. live. ARA.com. Yeah. Uh, ARA, right. Project yeah. ARA.com. And April 16th, you said? April 15th and 16th. So April 15th and 16th, they can go to ProjectARA.com and watch and learn. Yep. And if they want to participate at the Computer History Museum, they got to just email you and get a... Yeah, so there's a registration page, both okay. for online and for in-person participation. Yeah. Uh, and we certainly welcome both. And, right. and also developers of all shapes and sizes, right? So from startups uh, uh, all the way to, to large, uh, uh, large OEMs, non-traditional participants in the smartphone industry, uh, you know, we really want to break it wide open. Awesome. Paul, this is amazing stuff, and congratulations on the progress. And uh, let's give a big round of applause for showing us the latest. Awesome. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, this is a gift. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It all is right. not. Um,